Welcome to How to Cook the Hat. I'm Anne Reardon and today I'm attempting to make a 150 year old recipe with no modern appliances. My stand mixer is not allowed. Blender didn't exist back then and there was no fridge or freezer. The only exception in this challenge is going to be the stove and the oven because I couldn't get a working antique wood oven. I have chosen the Neapolitan Timbale because the drawing of it looks pretty impressive. First up it says to blanch, peel, wash and dry the almonds. It only takes a moment for the skins to become loose, but individually peeling the skins off each almond is an arduous task. I'm convinced that there must be a quicker way, so I tried rubbing them together in a cloth, but it didn't prove to be very helpful either. You've still got to pick it off each one individually. I am very grateful that we can now buy blanched almonds at the shops. Next it says to pound them in a mortar, moistening them with some white of egg to prevent their turning oily. The mortar and pestle are my least liked antique gadget. They are great for spices and tiny amounts of things but pounding large quantities of anything in them is really hard work. Look at that, look, a bit has broken off. Well, that was unexpected. Hmm, I don't wanna get bits of stone through the almonds. So due to breakage, I'm going to have to use the processor just for this bit to finish the rest of the almonds off. It's not giving quite the same texture that I was getting from pounding them, but if you press it together, it's pretty close. So we'll have to go with that. Next it says, when well pounded, add the flour, the butter, the sugar, the grated peel of a lemon, and the salt. A stand mixer would be perfect right about now. This is definitely not going to mix in like this. I wonder if they used the mortar and pestle for this step too. I'm just gonna have to use my thumbs and fingers and rub it in like you would if you were making pastry. It says mix to a stiffish paste with the yolk of eggs added one at a time. I sure hope this tastes good because it's certainly been a lot of effort to make even just to get to this stage. Roll out the paste to a quarter inch thickness. Cut it into rounds with a four inch plane cutter and cut out the inside of each round with a three inch plane cutter. This is so much smaller than I was expecting. I thought this dessert was going to be big, like a big cake size, but this is gonna be teeny tiny. According to the picture, we need 22 of these rings. They are going to take a while to cut out and bake. At this point, I'm very happy that I couldn't find an antique wood oven, because imagine lighting the fire to keep all of these baking equally, that'd be hard. Then it says make and bake a round of pâté d'office, six inches in diameter. These old recipes often do this. In the middle of a recipe, they tell you to make some other recipe and then you have to search through the book for that one. Pâté d'office is apparently a sweet paste for ornaments. It says to melt the sugar in the water over a slow fire. Then mix the flour with the syrup added by degrees and work the paste until it is quite smooth. It's a bit of an unusual texture, but this is pâté d'office apparently. It says to cut out a six inch circle. And you can see when I pull off this spare dough that it is really quite a stiff dough to work with. This has been baked for 15 minutes and it's super hot, but it hasn't browned at all. And I'm wondering if that is why this one is used for making ornaments because it stays white. But just in case, I'm gonna put it back in the oven for a little bit longer until it does go brown. Next, it says to brush it over with a little white of egg. One of the other old cookbooks I have says to use a feather for this job, and it does surprisingly well. Then it says to strewn it with green sugar. Now, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get this sugar to stick to the sides like this. I'm gonna to have to put it flat and push it up to the sides. That seems to be getting some to stick to it. Now it doesn't say to heat this, but I'm gonna put it in the oven just to cook the egg white, just to be on the safe side. Next, make a stiff icing with some red currant juice and fine sugar. 
I couldn't get red currants or red currant juice. It's the wrong time of year here. So I'm using pure cherry juice instead. And this actually makes a pretty pink colored icing with a nice flavor to it. This would be really nice as a donut glaze. Then it says to put it into a paper cone. Now the book gives very complex sounding directions for folding a paper cone, like divide the hypotenuse BC into three equal parts at D and O. And this one is definitely easier to show in a video than it is to write in a cookbook. Just grab a triangle of baking paper and have one of the corners facing you. Take one of the other corners and roll it under and line it up with the corner that is facing you. Then take the other corner and wrap it around the outside of the cone and bring it up to meet the other two points. And then you just fold those points over a couple of times to secure it all in place. And now you can tip your icing into the bag. It says when the paste rings are cold, press some of the icing on one of them and stick another on top. Now the picture in the book had 22 of these rings, but I think that's gonna look disproportionately tall if I keep going. So far I've got 19 rings and I already think that looks a bit tall, but just let me straighten them up a bit. Then it says to put it on the round of pate de office. I'm assuming that we use more icing to make that stick into place. Next it says ornament with some puff paste patterns. And once again, we find ourselves needing to follow another recipe from elsewhere in the book. Before we make the puff paste, let me tell you about an absolutely mouthwatering competition from today's sponsor, Love and Pies, who are celebrating their super sweet second anniversary with an ultimate bake out bash. You could win a casserole dish and this prize pack filled with goodies. To celebrate their second anniversary, they have lots of in-game events and even a real life baking contest. To get involved, firstly, you'll need to download the Love and Pies app on your phone or tablet. It's available on iOS and Android. It's easy to play. All you have to do is merge ingredients together to make items that the customers order. Amelia, the main character, is fixing up her mum's cafe, baking the cakes and solving mysteries along the way. While the birthday celebrations are on from the 16th to 30th of September, there are lots of extra in-game events, storylines and rewards, including this exclusive free birthday decoration for your cafe. So make sure to download today, grab your free gift and find out how to enter the amazing competition. Back to our 200 year old recipe. Next it says sift the flour onto the board and make a hole in the middle. Put in the salt and part of the water. Mix, adding the water by degrees, being careful to sprinkle the water all over the flour and mix it in evenly. It says to work the paste well, but despite lots of kneading and slowly trying to incorporate more water, I still have this much water left and it's already quite a soft, wet dough. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to use any more of that water. Next, it says to work the butter in a cloth to expel all the water that's in it. And if the paste is made in the winter, work the butter until it is quite smooth. With puff pastry, it is important that your pastry and your butter are the same consistency so that when you roll it out, they kind of move together. Otherwise, it just won't work. While I've never used a cloth to achieve this before, it does work surprisingly well. It says to fold over the sides of the paste so as to enclose the butter and form a square. This book actually has beautiful woodblock print illustrations which make the instructions for puff pastry easy to understand. Then it says to roll out the paste to a three foot length, fold over one third of the length, flatten it slightly with a rolling pin and then fold over the other third. Now to get it three foot in length, it's become very thin and not at all like their picture, but let's continue anyway. Turn the paste around and roll it again to the length of about three feet and fold it over and repeat this six times, letting the paste rest for 10 minutes between every two turns. After all of that folding and rolling and resting, let's go back to the dessert recipe. Roll it out to 1 16th inch thickness and cut it with some fancy cutters. Using the illustration as a guide, it mainly seems to be circles of all different sizes and even some pieces of circles. I don't know what this shape is called. Does it have a name? <laughs> Let me know. 
these patterns are pretty intricate and it takes a crazy amount of time to cut them all out and put them together. It says dredge some fine sugar over the patterns and bake them in a brisk oven. This may all look fairly quick on video but so far this dessert has taken 10 hours and I'm not even finished. Next I'm supposed to stick these on using apricot jam. For the ones around the bottom that is totally fine. Well, almost fine. And that should have been a warning for the problems that would lie ahead. If you like a good dose of frustration in your afternoon, then this recipe is for you. Once you've finally got those to stick, add a ring of cherries around the top. Next it says, when about to serve, fill the timbale with some vanilla cream ice. Split two sticks of vanilla lengthwise in four pieces. Look at all those beautiful vanilla seeds in there. Then it says to boil a quart of cream and put the pieces into the boiling cream and let the vanilla steep for one hour. Break 12 yolks of eggs in a stew pan. This is either going to be a huge quantity or it's going to be super rich ice cream. Add 12 ounces of pounded sugar and work them together with a wooden spoon. Mix in the vanilla cream. Now this is quite cold now because it's sat for an hour for that vanilla just to get the flavour infused into the cream. And then it says to stir it over the fire without boiling until the custard coats the spoon. Now this won't be as thick as you might think a normal custard would be and when it says coats the back of the spoon it just means heat it until when you draw a line across the spoon the line stays there. Next, strain the cream through a silk sieve into a basin and let it get cold. Set a freezing pot in some mixed pounded ice and bay salt. Now salt lowers the freezing point of water so it makes some of the ice melt and you get a liquid that is below zero but not frozen. Pour in the cream and work it with a spatula and when it is set mix in three gills of whipped double cream. I think this is going to take a while to set. My modern ice cream bowl that goes on the stand mixer takes 15 minutes but this is nowhere near as cold as that. So let's whip the cream while we're stirring this and keep going back and forth between the two. Making these old recipes really makes me appreciate modern appliances. Even just hand whipping cream takes a lot of energy. It's a good arm workout. And after an hour of stirring, this is finally getting colder and firmer. So let's stir in the whipped cream. Adding whipped cream here seems like quite a good idea for making the ice cream a little bit more airy. But of course it has also made it warmer again so it is runny all over again. Next it says to close the freezing pot and cover it with pounded ice and leave it for two hours. Two hours later and it is not set in the middle but it's quite firm on the edges. It's still going to be pretty soft. Pile it up in the middle of the dessert and after two days of work, the Neapolitan timbali is complete. Let's see how it tastes, starting with the ice cream. So it's inside of here? Yes. Oh, I see. Is it good? Like, should I have grabbed this much? Here we go. Interesting, it's definitely different. Like, super creamy. It's pretty good. Let me finish the spoon. It's softer than normal ice cream. Not super cold. Good flavours, but quite thick and not super cold. Probably because it was made in a barrel, not a freezer. But as far as regular ice cream goes, this will pass. I don't mind it. Open your eyes. Whoa! That looks amazing! What? What is it? <laughs> it's like a pancake stack with grass at the bottom and Cheerios on the outside and ice cream on top with cherries. Wow. It looks like a castle. Very ornate. And this is all made. <laughs> of course. You've got grass, you've got your decorated tower, your bleeding heads of your enemies. How do you reckon you serve it? <laughs> I don't know. I, it just it feels like it needs a 
a little ornate hammer or something that just clock it and then it breaks apart and you'll take a shard. Right, is it ice cream all the way down? Yeah. That's a lot of ice cream. Would you like get a serving thing and go in between each disc? Probably more be the case of hack and smash and then everyone dives in. Let's try this. I like it. It's like a crispy ice cream sandwich. These little pastry rings, they're really yum. It's a bit like an ice cream sandwich. Like the ice cream's melty, so you'd really have to serve it kind of straight away, like two days to make it, and then pretty much time it perfectly. This is probably one of the first 200 year old ones that I think could still, you know, you could still sell today and it would make money. It's not a horse head in jelly or something like that. It's actually yum. With thanks to my amazing patrons for your support of this channel. Make it a great week by being kind to others. And I'll see you on Friday.